in the third grade, I decided that I wanted to play the saxophone because Bill Clinton played the saxophone. I'll just let you think about that for a little bit. I don't know if that's a good reason to pick an instrument, but it's why I picked mine. And so for the next couple months, my parents were really big on helping me learn about music that featured the saxophone so that I would appreciate it. Because when you're learning an instrument, all you play is like hot cross buns. If you've ever played an instrument, you know it's beep, beep, beep. That's all you learn for the first couple months you play an instrument. And so at an early age, my parents exposed me to bands like Casey and the Sunshine Band and James Brown. And let me be real with you. I love me some James Brown. Because in like middle school, I just started listening to him and it featured instruments like the saxophone and trombone and trumpet and just funk music in general was so cool. And if you're not familiar with James Brown, James Brown is a short guy. He was probably the best performer of his time. He didn't really sing. He kind of talked saying. So instead of singing like a normal person, he'd kind of like shimmy and be like, hey, get up. That's what he would do. <laughs> so he would be like, hey, get up. That's what he would do. And so he, he was a great performer. He would sweat more than like any person in the history of the world has ever sweat. And he had this gross haircut, but his outfits were awesome. And the coolest thing that James Brown did was that he had such good chemistry with his band that at any moment, whenever he wanted, he could kind of take things up to a next level. So he would shimmy, and he'd be singing, and he'd be like, hey, get up, hit me. And the band would kill it. <laughs> and so, you know, as I started watching, you know, old VHSs of James Brown or videos of James Brown, at any moment, whenever he wanted, he would just go, hit me. And the band would crush it. I could do this all day. Hit me. Hit me two times. I mean, it's killer. <laughs> Having a band behind you is off the chain. And here's the thing, though. I grew up loving the saxophone. I was playing the saxophone throughout high school, and so I liked watching other saxophone players to see how good they were and their little mannerisms. But here's the thing about the hit. If you just did the hit without the band and just the saxophone, here's how it goes. Hit me! <laughs> it's, it's really lame. It's like the definition of weak sauce. But when you have the whole band behind you, hit me! Oh, come on. That's good stuff. Imagine if you had the hit in real life. Just real, just come along with me for a second. Imagine if you could do the hit in any arena of life. Like say you've been working hard and you need a raise. You walk in the meet and you're like, I need some more money. Hit me. You just might get it. You might get that raise. Or maybe you're looking for the love of your life and you're at a club. Probably shouldn't be looking at the club for the love of your life in the first place. But you're at the club and you're like, hey girl, you want to dance? And she says, no, I ain't dancing with you. And you say, forget you. I'll dance by myself. Hit me. There'd be a line around the club to dance with you. <laughs> and I know there are a lot of educators here at Mosaic, a lot of teachers. You guys have a tough job, and sometimes there's just that one kid who you, you just want to, tell me if you don't shut up, hit me! <laughs> You'd run the school district <laughs> if you had a band behind you. And it's all a lot of fun. Let's, let's get serious for real. The real reason that I want to talk about this is hit me! <laughs> oh, I could do this all day. Hit me twice! <laughs> hit me three times! <laughs> All right, give it up. They did a good job. <laughs> and so the hit, it's powerful. It's cool. But as we saw with the saxophone, when it's just one instrument, it's like, wah, wah. it's not good. But the thing about the hit that works is that each and every person on the stage had a role. They knew their role, and they did what they, didn't know, they knew how to do. So Dylan on the keys, he, he did what he knew how to do. And Meredith on the drums, she did that. And Josh on the sax, he did that. They don't know how to do each other's stuff, but they did what they knew how to do, and they got to be part of something pretty significant. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're in the middle, we're actually at the end of our series, Catalysts, and we've been looking at key elements that are essential to help us grow in our faith. And over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about providential relationships, pivotal circumstances, and private discipline, and how these things are key to help us grow in our faith to a place where we have a real, you know, incredible relationship with God. But today I want to talk about the final catalyst, and as you heard Jess say earlier, that's personal ministry. What does it look like for us to have a personal ministry? And so that's a churchy term. I'm not going to pretend like it's not, so let's unpack that real quick. When I talk about having a personal ministry, I'm talking about having a personal mission. And not just a mission where you have a New Year's resolution or something you want to accomplish in your lifetime. A personal ministry is a personal mission of yours where you're passionate about being what God's passionate about. When we look at the Bible, we look at people who had incredible ministries. They had ministries that were focused on God's mission. 
and aligning themselves with what God already cared about to help them accomplish that goal. And so when I talk about personal ministry today, I'm talking about taking a spot on God's team to help him accomplish what we know he cares about. And that's what we see in Luke 19, verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. That's Jesus talking. He, he's saying, here's what we're about, seeking and saving the lost. And so when we talk about personal ministry, what I'm talking about today is how do we, as people in Maryland, align ourselves with what we know Jesus to be caring about, and how do we get on the team to be a part of that? And so here's sort of a, a big thing I want to address real quick before we get into personal ministry. Regardless of whether you're a Christian or someone who's simply investigating if you believe a, la- a relationship with God is possible, having a personal ministry is a great way to open yourself up to be a part of God's mission. So getting on his team is a great way to experience him moving in your own life. And if you're still investigating this whole faith thing, I want you to know that there are opportunities here at Mosaic where you can get on the team and start to be a part of God's mission, and in the process, you'll get to experience him moving in your life. There are some teams where we're pretty thorough about what you've done and whether or not you're good to to serve, mainly in the kids' ministry. We do background checks for all our kids' volunteers, so we want you to know that we don't just let anybody hang out with your kids. We're very intentional about that. We're very particular. We want to make sure that your kids are in a safe place. But regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey, Serving and being a part of God's mission and having a personal ministry is something that we should all be a part of. And I think the Bible backs this up. In Philippians 2, this is a guy named Paul who used to hate Christians and then he encounters Jesus and he becomes a Christian. He writes a letter to a bunch of Christians in this town called Philippa. And here's what he says about this idea of having a personal ministry. He says in Philippians 2, verse 1 through 4, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other and loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And right here in Paul's letter, it shows us that the way to experience these things that we all desire, like love encouragement, compassion, community, not just with others, but with God, the way that we get to experience this stuff is by pouring ourselves out to serve it to other people. You see, we've got to change how we view volunteerism in our culture. We've got to change how we view serving, because when we look at the Bible, having a personal ministry is not about the impact you have in the world. It's about the impact God wants to have in you. Having a ministry is not about what you're going to accomplish. It's what God wants to accomplish in you. Have you ever gone into a social environment or a setting and expected one thing and got something completely different? That happened to me in college. In college, I was the guy who loved dancing at weddings when no one else was on the dance floor. Like, I'm that guy. No one else is out there, and you just see me come out with, like, a beer or something, and I'm just kind of, like, grooving to myself. Everyone's like, that guy's a lunatic. That's me in college. And me and my friend Alan, we realized that a good, if we were trying to pursue a lady— you know, I got my wife's attention because I started dancing. You know, I was a dancer. I'm not a great dancer, but I was confident enough to do it. So that's how I got my wife's attention. And me and Alan, Alan was single at the time, so he's trying to get a lady, you know. So we're, we would go to weddings and just kind of groove and have a great time when no one else is dancing. We kind of get the party going. And so we built this reputation over time. And towards the end of my time in college, both Alan and I got invited to a wedding where we knew the people pretty well, but not that well. And the wedding was really expensive, so we felt kind of bad for accepting the invitation, but we went anyway. We bought him a gift. It's okay. We bought him a gift. So we get there, and the ceremony's beautiful. Everything's good. It's really nice. We're like, oh, this is expensive. And then the re- uh, reception begins, and the dance floor is empty. So Alan and I, we just start grooving, you know? I don't know what this is I'm doing, but this is what I do sometimes. So I just grab a cup, and I'm just moving. And so I get on the dance floor, and about an hour in, it gets packed. Everybody sees us doing it. They all get in. The dance floor is crazy. It's awesome. And then we get really hot and sweaty. So we're like, all right, let's just go get a drink. And so we start to walk off the dance floor. And the wedding planner grabs us and says, where are you guys going? And me and him are like, oh, uh, hey, we're just thirsty. We're going to get a drink. We'll take a break, and we'll be right back. And she goes, no, 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 no. I'll get you the drink you need. You stay on the dance floor. Whatever you need the rest of the day, I'll get you your drinks and food, whatever. You just stay on the dance floor. And so for the next two hours, that happens. Anytime we tried to leave, the woman would grab us and be like, no, 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 where are you guys going? Come on, just stay on the dance floor. Stay on the dance floor. And, it, and like halfway through this whole ordeal, I realized... I didn't get invited to this wedding to be a guest. I got invited because they wanted us to keep the dance party going. And to be honest with you, I wasn't that mad about it. (laughs) 
I felt pretty cool. I was like, all right, they're giving me like filet mignon to make sure this party keeps going. <laughs> but I went into that situation expecting one thing, you know, just to have a good experience, have a good uh, wedding experience as a guest. But I realized my purpose for being there was completely different. And I think that happens to all of us when we begin to partake in personal ministry. I've heard numerous stories of people who have ministries here at Mosaic who are going on mission trips, and they go thinking, yeah, I'm going to impact this, and I'm going to impact this, but then all of a sudden, over time, you start to realize the whole reason you're there is because God's got a good work to do in you. And that reinforces that having a personal ministry isn't about how you impact the world, it's how God wants to impact you. Because being a part of God's team fuels a real, intimate relationship with him that only comes when you get on his team and partake in his mission to seek and save the lost. And so if you're here and you're a skeptic and you're not a follower of Jesus, and you're unsure about where you land on a lot of this faith stuff, I want you to know that this point is still relevant to you. That this isn't something that just gets tossed aside because you're not a Christian. Because here at Mosaic, we want everyone to join the team. Regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey, And the reason we say that is because we believe by committing yourself to God's mission here at Mosaic, you're going to get to experience God moving in your own life in a manner that may not be possible outside of serving. And so we create ways to do that with our serving teams. And I can't reinforce it enough. Regardless of where you're at in your journey, serving others is a great way to experience God moving in your life. And it's not like just helping Habitat for Humanity. That's a good cause, and that's a really good thing. I know people here that do that. But when you get to be a part of God's mission, to seek and save lost people, you get to experience him moving in your heart that does not occur elsewhere. And it's an incredible opportunity. So the first thing we got to understand about having a personal ministry is that doing it is not about the impact you're going to have on the world. It's about the impact God wants to have in you. But it doesn't end there. And as we understand the why of why having personal ministry matters, we get to move into the how. What does it look like for us to actually have a personal ministry? And so today, the big Bible verse we're going to read is in Matthew 14. It's written by Matthew. He's one of Jesus' disciples. And we're going to look at a story that involves Jesus, a miracle, and the disciples. And we're going to see what these disciples can do in terms of serving as a compass for us as we navigate through this journey, this story that we see in the Bible. And so real quick, I want to preface it with this. Right now, we picture the disciples as these like spiritual juggernauts of the faith. They're like Christian superheroes. They're the disciples. They're the apostles. You know, they're great guys, and that's true. They did a lot of incredible things. But at this point in the story, at this point in their lives, they're kind of just regular dudes. The 12 men Jesus decided to hang out with the most were tradesmen and fishermen and a tax collector. So I want you to picture, like, merchants who barter on the side of the road, a bunch of guys from Deadliest Catch, and then a tax collector that nobody likes. That's who Jesus' Jesus's crew is. And so as we look at this, I want you to picture them like that, not these big superheroes with a big seal on their chest and a cape, representing like carrying a big cross. That's not who the disciples were. So let's get into it in Matthew 14. At this point, Jesus heard the news. At at this point in the story, his son's, or I'm sorry, Jesus' cousin has been beheaded. Jesus' cousin has been beheaded, so he's grieving the death of his cousin. It says, as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, That isn't necessary. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. And in this moment, the disciples do what so many of us are really good at. The disciples identified a problem, but weren't really willing to do anything about it. The disciples identified that it's a remote place, there's lots of people, there's not enough food, it's getting late, Jesus, send them home. This is a problem, you've got to take care of this. But they didn't really present a solution, they weren't really willing to do anything about it, and this brings us to what I think so many of us are good at, especially in our culture. And here's what I'm not talking about when I say personal ministry real quick. I'm not talking about buying Tom's shoes. That's a good thing, but I'm not talking about buying Tom's shoes, that's not a personal ministry. Buying fair trade coffee is not a personal ministry. Making sure the chicken you eat for dinner was raised with loving parents and given every opportunity possible, that is not a personal ministry. But what also isn't a personal ministry is hashtag advocacy or slacktivism. Because I know I'm really good at that. I've been a part of that. I'm good at that. Do you guys remember Coney 2012? Remember this? Invisible Children, it's a, it's a good organization, uh, sent out a massive video making everyone aware about this guy, Joseph Coney, who was responsible for killing thousands of people in Uganda. He used child soldiers 
Uh, he's a, unequivocally a horrible person. He's a very, very bad guy. But in a video Invisible Children made, it made millions of people aware of how bad he was. But mostly what happened in our context is people changed their Facebook profile picture, sent out a tweet with a hashtag, maybe gave in a couple bucks so they gave a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, and that's pretty much all we did. And here's why I think hashtag advocacy doesn't work. It's because independent researchers will show that awareness campaigns lead us to believe that awareness will solve the problem, and that's not always the case. It takes more than that. We can't operate under the assumption that making someone aware of the problem in and of itself solves the problem. And we see this not just in our life now, but with the disciples. I mean, they made Jesus aware of the problem. They said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But they didn't present any solution to remedy the issue. And if that's all that we do, if we just raise awareness for stuff and not get in the game and do something, we're missing out on the great opportunity that we have to be a part of God's mission. And for the record, I'm not bashing you if you change your Facebook profile to a cause that you believe in, but I am bashing you if that's all you do and you do it to appear philanthropic and, and that's all you do. Because I believe God's called us to be people who act. And I know I'm being a little unfair about some of this stuff for the sake of making a point, but the truth is the disciples were a lot like us. They're quick to identify what's a problem, but they were slow to resolve it. But thankfully for us, it doesn't end there and we get to see what the disciples did next. So let's keep reading. In verse 18, after the disciples say, hey, we don't have enough food, what are we going to do? Jesus says this. He says, bring them here. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. And real quick, I don't know about you, but do you ever wonder if Jesus, like, had to stretch before he committed a miracle? Like, if he was like, all right, Thomas, watch this. This is going to be awesome. I don't know. I tried to look and see if there's any, like, pregame ritual like LeBron James that Jesus did. It's not in there. I looked it up. But here's the big takeaway for us when we look at this story. At first glance, it, doesn't it kind of look like the disciples missed the boat? It, it looks like they missed the point. They had an opportunity to serve thousands of people, but they decided to just say, Jesus, you handle this. But actually, when I look closer, we all see that the disciples didn't miss the boat. Yeah, maybe it took them a while to get there, but they were a part of this miracle. They were intimately involved in the amazing thing that God did here. You see, there were thousands of hungry people, and, and I almost can't even blame the disciples because they didn't even have a vocabulary for addressing that type of problem. But as Jesus begins to perform the miracle, the disciples did simply what they knew how to do. They knew how to hand out bread. So that's what they did. It says in verse 19, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. And God doesn't need us to tell him about all the problems of the world. He knows that stuff. And it's good for him to cry out to him about the injustices in the world and the things that we need him to be a part of the solution. It's good to do that. But what he desperately wants us to do is act and be a part of his mission. And so if we are going to have a personal ministry that serves as a catalyst to help us strengthen our faith, it doesn't take some grandiose scheme or some incredible mission statement or some superpower leader to come along. What it takes is for you to do what you know how to do and position yourself to be a part of God doing something amazing. And so that's our next point. Do what you know how to do, and then watch God do something amazing. Have you ever heard the term role player in a sporting event? You ever watch TV and have them say, oh yeah, that guy's a great role player. Truth is, if you played sports in high school, you know you don't want to be a role player, because it's kind of a stompliment. It kind of means you're good enough to be on the team, but you're not good enough to really play consistently. No one really wants to be a role player. And I'm watching the NBA playoffs right now. It's like the final four of the NBA. And I was looking at some stats. And between 1957 and 1969, basically one team won the championship every year. And it was the Boston Celtics. And so if you look at the team, I'm sorry, if you look at the list of names of guys who've won an NBA championship of all time, numbers one through eight on that list all played for the Celtics dynasty during those years. It's ridiculous. All those guys won championships. But if you get rid of that dynasty and you reset the list of people outside of the dynasty who's won the most NBA championships, 
Do you know who won the most? It's not Michael Jordan. It's not LeBron. It's not Kobe. It's not Shaq. It's not Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It's this guy named Robert Ori. And Robert Ori uh, won eight NBA championships. He has eight championship rings. And he played in the league for 16 years, which means he won a championship half the time he played. Half of the years he was in the league, he got to hoist the trophy. And guess how many All-Star games Robert Ori was in? Zero. He made zero All-Star games throughout his career. And so when you look up Robert Ori online, people bash this guy because he won all these trophies but never got any personal accolades. But I can just picture my man Robert holding up eight rings and going, fellas, the ladies don't know the difference. <laughs> Robert Ori was a role player. He could drain a three when it mattered. He was clutch. And he could post up, he could dunk. He, he did a lot of role-playing jobs for the teams he was on, like the Lakers and the Trailblazers and the Spurs. But he was a role player. And the thing about professional sports teams, when, when you win a championship, everyone gets a ring, the star and the equipment manager. And so being a role player has value. And you may know where I'm going with this, but when it comes to our personal ministry, our job is to be a role player. Too often, we want to be the superstars. We are going to impact the world, and we're going to do this. No. Jesus is the superstar. He's the one that people are going to write headlines about. Our job is to do what we know how to do and position ourselves so that Jesus can bring the wow factor. And so here's how we get to play that out at Mosaic. Here's how we get to be role players. Something that our lead pastor, Carl, has said a good bit in some of our staff meetings is that for all of you here today, we don't want you to do something we want you to serve someone. It's not about just doing something. We want you to serve someone. And Jesus, the greatest leader of all time, here's what he said about his own leadership. In Matthew 20, verse 28, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And because Jesus sets this example for us, we don't apologize when we tell you that you need to be on a serving team at Mosaic because it's what Jesus did. And because Jesus teaches us that it's about service, we know that we're going to get to strengthen our relationship with him by getting to do what he did, and you're going to experience on a greater level what he's done for you in your own life. And so we don't apologize for telling you that you need to be on a serving team here at Mosaic and be a part of God's mission. But because Jesus takes this idea of personal ministry and lowers it to a bar that we can all obtain of doing what we know how to do, he eliminates our ability to make really big excuses. Because truth is, some of you here are telling me, and really you're telling God, I'm not down for some of this stuff that he's talking about. And when you do that, when you make excuses about why you can't, you're not focusing on what God can do. Because some of you here are saying, God, I don't have the education or the Bible knowledge to connect with the people that I want to connect with, so I can't really do this. Or God, I don't have the time to practice my instrument throughout the week, so I can't really commit myself to join the Mosaic Band. Or, God, I don't want to be the first person here and the last person to leave, so, you know, I can't do frontline. Or, God, I just got married, so I want to focus on myself and my relationship, and I'm not going to work to help other people experience God the way that I have in this place. And some of you are saying, man, that pulling mission trip sounds really cool, but I'm terrified of flying, so, God, no, nah, not going. But what God wants you to do is to do all that you know how and let him do the amazing stuff. And because I listed some of these excuses we all make, there's a chance that some of you might be feeling a little uncomfortable because you know God is pushing you to one of these serving teams or one of these personal ministry opportunities. And for most of you, it feels uncomfortable. And I want you to know it's supposed to. It's supposed to feel uncomfortable. Andy Stanley is one of my favorite uh, speakers, Christian speakers, and he has a church in Atlanta. He's the guy who wrote the book about these faith catalysts. And here's what he says about it. He calls it flexing your faith muscle. And he says the whole reason that growing your faith is a lot like growing a muscle is because in order for it to grow, it's got to be stretched. It's got to be torn. There's got to be some tension in order for it to grow. And just like our muscles, no faith has ever grown significantly by sitting still and simply doing what you've been doing, by just going through the motions. In order to grow our faith, we've got to do things that are pretty uncomfortable sometimes to have the faith that we desire. And so from that idea, I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you were scared about anything in your faith? When was the last time over the six months that you were uncomfortable about anything in your spiritual journey? Because if there's nothing in the last six months, how do you know you're not stagnant? 
How do you know you're not just taking up space? And the truth is, for those of you that are skeptics or investigating Jesus and you come to Mosaic each week, you're a lot better at this than the Christians are. Because you come every week and you open yourself up to what God's communicating in the Bible and you hear messages that don't necessarily jive with your worldview or your lifestyle, but you keep coming. And for some of you that are skeptics, you're joining serving teams and growth groups that are talking about things that are a little uncomfortable for your life, but you're still stepping into it and you're being stretched and you're being grown. But if you're a Christian and there's nothing that's made you uncomfortable about your faith over the last six months, what evidence is there of your faith? What are you doing? And a direct solution to that, if there is nothing in your life over the last six months that scared you about your faith, a direct solution is embarking on a personal ministry. Because the truth is, is if you love Jesus and the friends that you know and your coworkers know that, if they know that you're all about Jesus, you better believe that they're watching you. They watch how you live. They're looking at the evidence that comes from your life, and they're going to look and see what case is there for what this guy is all about. And so we need to be living a life so intentional and with purpose that when they look at the evidence of our life, there's no doubt what you're about. There's no doubt that your hope is in something else, that you're not living life the way everyone else is, that your hope is in something bigger. And that's God's mission, to seek and save the lost. A great example of this at Mosaic is my friend Britt. Britt has a great job and a good career, and she recently just decided that she was going to quit taking grad school classes because she felt God nudging her to have a bigger influence in our kids' ministry at Mosaic. And so she's stopping grad school to serve at a church more. And if one of her coworkers finds out about this, there's not going to be any question what her life's about. There's no doubt, because she's taking away in her life something that is a good thing. Education is a good thing. But she's doing it to step into what God has for her by serving on the kids' ministry here even more. And the reality is, for some of you, serving on a team may not be that challenging, but the time you have to give up is what you're scared of. Holding a door open for our frontline team isn't that hard of a thing, but giving up the time to get here a little early is a thing that you're holding on to. And the truth is, where you put your time, that's what you really care about. But like a lot of things in life, what is once difficult can get easy over time. So there are people here, I know, who've been serving at Mosaic for maybe years, but you feel like you haven't done anything uncomfortable over the last six months. So I want to give you a quick challenge. If that's you, if you've been serving and you're part of God's team, but you haven't felt challenged or scared about something, here's something I want to give you. Pick a place that you go pretty often, every couple, you know, every couple days or maybe a few times a week. I want you to pick a place like a park, a coffee shop, a gym, and I want you to sit in your car and pray before you get out every time. I want you to sit in your car and pray and ask God to bring people into your path that day, not just in the future, but that day that you can have unique conversation and connection with and see if as you step into that room, something doesn't change. Your faith isn't ignited. You're, you're scared about the opportunity or the conversation that may come because you may feel inadequate to do it, but God's going to make it available for you. And so if you're serving here and that's great, but you don't feel challenged, I dare you to do that this week when you're going to the coffee shop or when you're going to the gym or even next time you go to a bar. Pray that prayer in your car and ask God to bring people in your life where you can have a unique connection with them. Because, guys, we can't change people's hearts. That's, that's what Jesus does. But we got to do what we know how to do, which is position ourselves to be a part of the amazing work that he can do. But for some of you here, all this stuff kind of means nothing because your, your life is a mess. Every week our staff prays over prayer requests that you guys write on connection cards. And over the last couple weeks, it just made me aware of how much hurt and pain is in this room. That there's a couple who has to do brain surgery on their baby, and it's going to change the trajectory of their life, and it's going to make life really hard. And there's a guy who's addicted to drugs, and he wants to know what it means to serve God, but he's addicted to the drug, and he can't get off it. And there's a number of marriages here that are on the brink of divorce because one of you wants to be here and the other one wants nothing to do with church. And if that's you, I know you're probably telling me, Jonathan, I can't serve. i got to fix myself. And I get you. I think Jesus does too. But Jesus is not focused on what he can get out of you. He's focused on what he can put inside you. Joy, compassion, hope, and grace. And these, key, these things come from serving in his mission. 
And if you feel like you're nothing but broken pieces today, I want you to know that Jesus hears you and he wants to restore you. But when it comes to personal ministry, I think he's telling you the same thing he told the disciples in verse 18. He says, bring them here. The disciples said they only had a couple loaves of bread. Jesus says, bring them here. You've got a marriage that's in the crapper. Jesus says, bring it here. You've got a baby that you have to do surgery on, and you don't know if your child's going to have the life that you wanted for it. Jesus says, bring that life here. If you've got an addiction that you can't break, Jesus says, bring it here. And through and by joining in God's mission, he's going to restore that, and he's going to bring hope in your life. Because a real, tangible relationship with Jesus is not a consumer relationship where we take, take, take. It's a servant relationship where we get to give to others what Jesus has given to us. And by doing that, we get to experience the things that we so desperately desire. An intimate relationship with God is the great benefit of ministry. And here's why I know that's true. Because I've gotten to be a part of Mosaic for a couple years now. First as a volunteer, and then as a staff member. And every time someone gets in that tub to, and gets baptized and commits their life to Jesus and acknowledges that, that Jesus is the one who's going to save them and give them the life that they've been looking for, every time that happens, I get to experience joy, hope, and purpose on a completely new level because I'm on the team, because I get to be a part of what God's doing at Mosaic. And I'm not saying Mosaic is the best church in the world, but guys, the team that God has built here at Mosaic, what we get to be a part of, it's winning. God is running up the score. We've had 45 people experience new life in Christ this year, and it's not even June yet. I love getting to be a part of this team. That's right, yeah. And in those moments when someone gets in that tub and they start to lose it because they realize what they've been chasing after is Jesus their whole life, I understand more of what he's done for me because I'm a part of the team. I understand more in that moment that more than 2,000 years ago, God bankrupt heaven to know me and to know you. And that he sent his son, a perfect savior, who was murdered without a cause because he said a lot of controversial things about how we should live. But we take all that seriously because he came back to life. He didn't just say, I'm the way. He proved it. He came back to life. And he did so that, that we could live and know God. And that reality that we get to live in, that you get to be a part of by joining in his team, gives us purpose we could never have had, hope we didn't know existed, and grace we don't deserve. And grace from man means you get another shot. Grace from God means I'm giving you new life. And that's what personal ministry is about. It means joining in God's mission to help other people experience that hope and that grace. So right now, uh, regardless of whether or not you're on a team, I would love everybody here to take out your connection card. Everybody just do it so it doesn't look awkward. Everybody just do it right now so no one's going to be like, oh, he's checking off a card. Just grab a connection card. And I want you to look at the back of it right now, and you're going to see it'll say band, cleaning team, frontline, kids ministry, parking team, tech team. And for those of you that aren't on the team yet here at Mosaic, I want to encourage you and challenge you. How are you going to get on board with God's mission? What is it that you know how to do that sets you up to be a part of something incredible that God wants to do in your life? We have 25 kids ministry opportunities alone, 25 roles that we want to fill. And no one's going to give you a medal. No one's going to give you a pat on the back. We'll give you a pat on the back, but no one's going to give you a medal for showing up each week. But do what you know how to do. You know how to read a curriculum. You know how to make a kid laugh. You know how to do that. And by doing that, you're setting yourself up to see God change a family's trajectory forever as the children learn about Christ's love in their lives. And so if you know how to do that, check off the kid's box. And you may not know how to ensure that a skeptic who's been burnt by the church can come to Mosaic and have a good time. You don't know how to do that. But what you do know how to do is throw on an orange vest and move some orange cones so that when he and his family pull up for the first time, they know that they're welcome. They know that we want them there. And they experience all that before they even get inside the door. And so if you know how to do that, sign up for the parking team. Or if you, if you want to be a part of a place that helps hundreds of broken people find restoration, but you don't know exactly how to do that, but you do know how to vacuum a carpet and clean a window, join the cleaning team. Because when people come in here and they see a place that looks nice, they realize these people care about us. Because one of the huge reasons people leave a church is because it looks like crap. And so by being on the cleaning team, you get to ensure that when people come in here, they realize this matters. 
And so if you know how to vacuum and clean and you want to reach people, join the cleaning team and check off that box. And by checking off a box, it doesn't mean you're signing your life away. It doesn't mean you're going to do it for six months. It just means I want more information about getting on board. You can check multiple boxes if you want. But the reason this matters is because what we get to experience in our faith when someone gets in that tub and we get to even deep, more deeply understand what he's done for us. I asked a friend of mine who serves a lot at Mosaic and also has a great personal ministry outside of Mosaic, why does he care so much about this topic? Why does he pour out hours of his week to do this? And he responded with a line I'll never forget. He said, a Super Bowl ring means the most to someone who played in the game. A Super Bowl ring means the most to someone who played in the game. So how are you going to get in the game? How are you going to join the team? And what role are you going to play in God's mission to seek and save those who are lost? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe that this is the greatest mission of all. It's better than any story that a movie could come up, better than any book that we've read that makes us feel like we get to do something cool. This is the mission that you were made us to be a part of. And for those of us that are missing out on the work that you can do in our lives, God, I pray that you would push them to check that box and to get on board. Just test it. Test the team and see if it's a good fit for them and see if they'd like to do it. And for the people that are here that or on the team, God, but they, they feel a little stagnant. I pray that you would give them boldness to do things that stretch their faith. Maybe a little uncomfortable, but help them step into those opportunities to serve you. And ultimately, God, I pray that all of us would do that because we want to better understand the depth of your love for us. That you served us by dying on the cross and beating death, and that we have an opportunity to serve others. We thank you for that reality that we get to live in. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.